Da, ora bakalım. Aha, yaş. <gülüyor> okay, başlayayım. Aha. Hello, my name is Polina Desetnichenko. I am uh, teaching ethnomusicology and musicology courses in Japan, in Wasada University in Tokyo. And my PhD is in also in ethnomusicology. I received it at the University of Toronto in Canada. Um, and my family, we came to Canada. We immigrated to Canada when I was nine years old from Ukraine. Well, I'm, I'm Ukrainian. So um, when I heard Mugam for the first time, it was in Canada when I was doing my PhD. And I completely fell in love with it. It was like love at first sound for me. So after that, I decided to focus only on Azerbaijani Mugam for my research. And uh, specifically, my topic is post-Soviet Azerbaijan. And I'm looking into how Mugam, how traditional music, helps to create identities, post-Soviet identities, for people in Azerbaijan. I remember my first time uh, when I came to Baku. It was um, in 2014. And um, what really surprised me was uh, every, every time I started to talk about Mugam, people started to cry. And it, this was very common, actually. For example, I lived in a hotel in the old city for the first time because I didn't know anyone. I just rented, um, just booked a room there. And in the morning when I went for breakfast, the owner of the hotel, he asked me, what am I doing here? And I said, I'm studying Mugam. And I saw immediately tears in his eyes and he said, well, this is music, this is our music, it runs in our veins, it's our, it's so important to us, it's like our blood. And he said, how could a foreigner, you know, study this? Why didn't you choose pop music instead? <laughs> so he was, he was quite surprised. And then I talked to people and I saw people are crying when they talk about Mugam. So, of course, immediately I understood it's very important, it's very valuable. And then um, when, I, uh, when I started to dig deeper and to research it, really, and take lessons on the tar and ghazal poetry, um, talking to musicians, talking to poets, talking to philosophers or other cultural figures, um, for them, it's even more important. And the way they, they um, interpret this music, you know, the ghazal meanings, the values. For example, if we look at ghazals that are sung in Mugam, um, we can see just, it's all about ethics. It's all about history, tradition, um, themes of love, themes of sacrifice and um, humanness, spirituality. So this is very, very meaningful, of course, for Azerbaijani people. So I would definitely say that I would define Mugam as a very powerful decolonial tool for Azerbaijani people. Of course, I hope that um, more and more people across generations would be more interested in Mugam. I think that there's not enough interest in it just because tendencies of you know globalization and westernization and things like that but i still think that even though even with these tendencies i, I still see it as a very very important um a kind of um, symbol for azerbaijani people and a way to define themselves one very distinguished ethnomusicologist bruno nettel he looked into um, a universal function of music everywhere for humanity in every single culture um, asking what is it that makes music so essential for people everywhere. And his conclusion was that peop uh, music is an important identity marker for people. This is how people um, understand who they are, understand their self. And um, um, in Azerbaijan, we have to know a little bit more about the history of Mugam in order to um, understand how it is a very powerful decolonial tool, as I said. So Mugam, actually, it's part of um, this very vast musical tradition that is there uh, in northwest China, among the Uyghurs, in Central Asia, in uh, Turkey, in Iran, in North Africa. It's very, it's called very similarly in all of these places, Makam, Mukam, Shash Makam. So Mugam is part of that. It's part of this Eastern kind of heritage, Eastern art. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that, um, 
Of course, Mugam, like all of these Makam traditions, it was developed in courts by Sufis. Um, if we, if, again, if we look at the Ghazal poetry, we can see these meanings. So it is rooted in um, Sufism, in Tasavvuf, in Irfan. And exactly these two factors in the Soviet era, they were targeted. And the Soviet reforms that were taking place in the 1930s, um, with Mugam, with literature, with everything, um, the goal was to make a secular national art for Azerbaijan, to separate it from the East, from Islam. And so this music was changed by quite a lot. And today, what I'm seeing among musicians, among poets, um, singers, is they're trying to bring back the pre-Soviet form of Mugam. Uh, for example, they are interested in more complex Ghazal poetry, like Fizuli, Nasimi, and very uh, sort of philosophical ideas that are there in the poetry. They're also bringing back um, precisely cycles, the Dasgah, the cycles of Mugam that were uh, prohibited, that were banned by Soviet reforms. So it becomes a very sort of decolonial movement in this way. And I think that even for general public, not talking about, you know, musicians or specialists in this music, but just people, uh, they know, even if they don't understand Fizuli to that depth, but when they listen to Mugam, even on the kind of the, the level of the body, the, sen the sense, the sense of Mugam, they they feel, you know, these meanings that are in the music. They feel that it's part of their identity, that history, that tradition, um, all of those cultural meanings that are in the music, they feel it, even on the bodily level. And that's why I think a lot of people start crying you know, when they hear Mugam. So I do think, and I really, as I said, I hope that um, there are more projects, there are more, there's more interest in this music because I think it's so important for Azerbaijani people to appreciate, to value this music that has been there, that connects them to the East, Eastern civilization, Eastern world, that connects them to spirituality, to, to Islam, uh, because this is, I think, a, p a very big part of their history, a very big part of who they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe I, I sh uh, to uh, or something else to say, I don't know what you want to say. Ah, yeah, yes, there is. A very important part of my field work in Azerbaijan was when I uh, found out about the Apsharan uh, villages, or you can call them suburban towns, Absharan Kandler, for example, Mashtaha, Hovsan. And um, it was when I was invited to, they have gatherings of poets and musicians. So they perform Mugam and they talk about Fuzuli, they talk about Nasimi, Sayyid Azim Shirvani, and they really um, kind of explore the meanings that are there in this music. And when I when I first, I was there, I was so inspired and I thought, why are, for example, um, students at the National Conservatory in Baku, why don't they attend these majlises? Why don't they come here? Because these institutions, they do have Soviet systems still in place. And it's so important that students find out about the real meanings of this music that have been, because of the Soviet times, they have been kind of um, censored, you know, and de-emphasized. So I really hope that um, this Apsharan culture of Mugam is much, much more wider known in Azerbaijan, especially for, uh, for students of Mugam and for people overall, because in the Soviet era, um, the meanings of Mugam were kept underground in Apsharan uh, suburban towns. They had weddings, they had what were called as Mugam weddings or Darvish weddings and um, also gatherings, majlises. And um, they, they um, kept alive a lot of these things that were censored by Soviet reforms. So that culture was so important historically. And I, and I really, I was so surprised and so um, amazed by it. And I really hope that um, today in the post-Soviet world, post-Soviet Azerbaijan, these, these traditions in these Kant um, are, are much more known among the sort of general public, especially students of Mugan. Um, for example, uh, I will play the one particular Mugam called Nava.
And Nava is a mugam because it's very similar to some other, for example, Nava in Iran. And um, it was used in some Islamic contexts. In the 1930s, um, they got rid of it. They kind of erased it from the curriculum. And today, there's a lot of effort among musicians to revive it, to find it. But it's very difficult because information has been lost. Um, Fergana Gasimova, recently, a couple of years ago, she made an attempt to, to rediscover Nava. And, um, but it's still a debate because a lot of musicians say, no, it's like this, and others say, no, it's like this. So they, they kind of debate, what, what is, where's the real Nava? And I was very lucky to learn from uh, Vamik Mamad Aliyev, who is, um, uh, he is a successor of uh, Ahmad Bakihan of lineage in Natar, and also Elhan Mansurov, who is a successor of Bahram Mansurov, because they both preserved Nava on the tar. But nobody knows how it is sung. The vocal version has never been found. But this is a kind of very decolonial, <laughs> decolonial muham here, this Nava. And this is... Um, this is just the beginning of it. But a very uh, well-known Mugam is Bayat Shiraz. Everyone knows Bayat Shiraz. It's much more kind of uh, popular. And um, uh, actually, before, there was no Bayat Shiraz. So Bayat Shiraz was um, uh, part of Bayat Isfahan, which is another Mugam. So not many people know that, but it's kind of... Bayat Shiraz is very similar to minor scale in Western music. So it was part of Soviet westernization of Mugam. Actually, this is how um, kind of it was um, popularized. And I'll just play a little bit of the beginning of it. Thank you. 